Welcome to Macro Musings, the podcast series where each week we pull back the curtain and take a closer look at the important macroeconomic issues of the past, present, and future. I'm your host, David Beckworth of the Mercatus Center. We are glad you've decided to join us. Our guest today is Sam Bell. Sam is the Policy Director of Employ America, a think tank dedicated to having the economy run at full employment levels. Sam is also known on FOMC Twitter as an influencer when it comes to nominations for the Board of Governors. Sam is also a returning guest to the show. Sam, welcome back. Thank you so much for having me, David. Oh, it's great to have you back. I missed our times together in D.C. I miss our FOMC watch parties. Luckily, we still have Twitter, and I get to interact with you there. But I thought it'd be great to have you back on the show, Sam, because this is a new year, a lot of big potential changes coming up at the Federal Reserve, at the Board of Governors, particularly when it comes to personnel questions. And you have got you know yourself right there in the, in the center of all this. You kind of have a good sense of what's going on. So I'm delighted to have you on to walk us through some big changes that might take place this year in 2021. Before we dive into that, though, Sam, as I mentioned, you're the director, the policy director of Employee America. Maybe just give our listeners a little bit about what's going on there, kind of the bird's eye view, what you guys are doing right now. Yeah, so we are dedicated to full employment, tight labor markets. We want rising wages. And we, like so many, are actually doing more on the fiscal side these days. So my colleagues, Liz and Arnab, were deeply involved in all of the congressional various iterations of relief bills and specifically on trying to get more generous unemployment insurance in terms of, you know, extended benefits. And uh, also, you know, we're, we're deeply invested in the concept of automatic stabilizers. So we want to, as much as possible, have relief tied not to some arbitrary date, but to conditions. So we're trying to work that in. We have we have been um, moderately successful on some fronts, not so successful on others. But, um, you know, I'm really lucky to be working with people who are much smarter than I am. I'm very in awe of their efforts. Uh, and yeah, and, and my colleague Alex Williams, who just joined us, has written something recently pushing back on the CBO and, you know, how they're, how they're thinking about fiscal multipliers in, in some of these uh, relief bills. And my colleagues Arnab and Skanda just wrote up a, a big report about the Secretary Mnuchin taking the, the CARES Act funds that were supposed to backstop the Fed facilities, taking them back, and he had legal authority to do that. So we're really trying to, um, I think we're getting more involved in fiscal policy, and we're trying to find these opportunities where a little bit of technical input, a little bit of research will, will go a long way, potentially, in terms of policy outcomes. That's a snapshot. Yeah. Now, you mentioned you got some smart talent on your team, and you do, but I want our listeners to know that Sam is the reason we have Employee America. He is the uh, policy innovator here himself, the entrepreneur of sorts, so he brought it together. And that's a nice segue into a question that was asked on Twitter to you. So, Sam, you you, you posed on Twitter some questions about coming on this show and any feedback. And one of the questions that uh, was sent back to you is, how did you get into this? How did you get on this path of becoming a Fed watcher and ultimately creating Employee America? Yeah, I'm sort of embarrassed to say that um, I was somebody who was very focused internationally for the early years of my career. I was doing international human rights and was basically in a mindset where we have challenges in the United States, but fundamentally, the good I can do in the world is, you know, abroad and globally. And the Great Recession really just knocked that out of me. And I really couldn't understand how we were dragging on for so long with so much what I felt was human suffering. And it drove me to sort of into this world. And, you know, you and and many others on Twitter helped guide me and helped educate me. And, um, Simultaneously, I was um, I was working with organizations, leaders of organizations on management issues. How do you run an organization well? And I had a sort of bird's eye view about what folks in Washington were doing, what issues they were working on. And you know, from my perspective, there was just very little focused on like, are we getting macro right, and are the big institutions working on these issues, like the Fed you know, 
getting pressure to do better and get to better outcomes, it felt like the, obviously a lot of people, you know, in financial markets are interested and there's a lot of media coverage, but it felt like a very barren landscape. And then Fed Up pop, popped up, uh, which was this activist campaign. And I ended up doing consulting for them. And then out of that, so Employ America. So I, I really got lucky and, and really, you know, Adi Barkin and, and the Fed Up folks really were the, were the avenue to sort of pull me into some of this, this Federal Reserve work. And, and you know, on um, me personally, I've been focused on Federal Reserve nominations and I just saw early on in the Trump period that people who were being in the conversation about Fed chair, their records were sort of undiscovered. And even people who I thought should be in the know didn't know sort of basic things about some of these potential Fed chair candidates. So I, that really drove me to like make this a full-time thing and start an organization. And, and we've expanded from there. Yes. And you have quite the legacy behind you. Maybe later we'll talk about some of the uh, Fed governors that didn't happen because of your efforts and your research. And I think we mentioned this on the previous show that you spent a lot of time in the Library of Congress researching some of these individuals. So you are a familiar face there based on your Fed research. All right. So a second question from Twitter for you is what signs, what dashboard of indicators are you looking for that will tell you? we are getting close to full employment. So we, we hope 2021 will be a great year, a great boom year. But what will you be looking for to tell you that we finally have arrived back at full employment? So I would encourage folks to, I think my, my colleague Scott has come up with a brilliant proposal about the Fed and its framework. And, you know, you've called it a close cousin of NGDP targeting, but, you know, he zeroes in on uh, gross labor income growth and says, you know, the Fed should be trying to get above a floor for gross labor income growth. And, you know, that's gross labor income is like, you know, incorporates flows into employment and also wage growth. So we, we like that. We like that metric. I don't know. And, you know, that's generally how we're thinking about things is like, let's get to a floor. So, you know, four, four and a half percent would be one floor for gross labor income growth. Another floor would be what what is the reason we can't get back to the year 2000 prime age employment to population ratio like that's one thing that looms large for us is like what what are intellectually it doesn't make sense why we wouldn't be able to to get back at least to there so we're looking at yeah participation wages employment and a host of other things but i, I would identify those three okay well, let's move on to the main thrust of our show, and that is this big year ahead of us. And we've just come off a very busy week in terms of Fed happenings. We are recording this January 15th, so this is the week of the 11th through the 15th. Next week is going to be a pretty quiet week for Fed events. This past week was very busy. A number of speeches, if I counted correctly, Sam, there were 13 different appearances Probably the most notable was Raphael Bostic in terms of regional presence. He started raising questions about tapering and the Fed's purchases, kind of, you know, got the market interested, some of us interested. But luckily, uh, you know, Jay Powell came along and kind of whacked that one down. I think Tim Dewey had a good article on that where he said, you know, Powell has hammered down any questions about tapering. It's not going to happen for a long time. And will happen in very different circumstances. There are also some, I think, great speeches from Lael Brainerd and Rich Clarita. And I just want to mention Rich Clarita's speech, Sam. Just indulge me here for a few minutes. It's very similar to the one he did in November. And in it, he lays out more of the details on this new framework the Federal Reserve introduced in August, the average inflation targeting framework. I mean, there was some excitement this week because this one-year window of at least 2% inflation for one year or more came up. But here's what I liked about that speech. And, and honestly, I had to read that speech in November several times to understand it. And I still have questions from it. I'm not sure I understand everything about it. But he really goes in depth in this article about temporary price level targeting. In fact, Rich Clarita calls it a version of temporary price level targeting like Ben Bernanke introduced in 2017. And then Bernanke, Kylie and Roberts in 2019 had a follow-up paper. And it's a version. And, and maybe you could call it a watered-down version or I, I kind of with some humor called it the poor man's version of temporary price level targeting. But I like his view of this, and I don't know if this represents the rest of the FOMC's view of it, but I, I'm, I'm excited to see Rich promoting this as a version of temporary price level targeting because 
Bernanke's original exposition of temporary price level targeting was it's a framework that does price level targeting when you're at the zero lower bound. And then outside of that, you go back to kind of a regular inflation target. And Bernanke is very clear. He said, look, at the zero lower bound, we've had some very severe demand shocks. And when we get away from that, we, we don't want to be overreacting because of some temporary inflation caused by supply shocks. And you start putting that together, you're like, okay, what is a framework that really worries about demand shocks, but wants us to avoid supply shocks? And, and to me, as an advocate of nominal GDP targeting, it screams some version of that. What, in my mind, temporary price level targeting does, it's, it's, it itself is a version of something like nominal GDP level targeting. In fact, if you look at, you know, like nominal income, nominal GDP over the past decade, it's been a relatively straight line. And I'm just excited, I guess, Sam, that, that he sees it this way, because then it really does reinforce the, the point that uh, Jim Bullard made when this was introduced, that this is a version of nominal GDP targeting, at least a step in the direction of that. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that perspective or not. Yeah, I think Clarida is... Um clearly a leader here. I think the question, and I'm always focused on personnel. I mean, I think the question is, does everybody on the FOMC see it the same way he does? On the one hand, he led the process. You know, on the other hand, when he talks about it, it sounds different than when Kaplan talks about it or when Bostic talks about it or, and maybe that's okay, but it strikes me that like the, the framework is a little bit in the eye of the beholder. So yes, I think I was surprised at him saying that explicitly. And I, until I saw your tweet that he had said previously, I, I yeah, I was surprised uh, at his, you know, inflation has to be running above 2% for a year before we're going to raise rates. And I think he and, he and Powell are very committed not to become Japan. And you've talked about it on your show a lot, but like they do not, they want to do, that's their big fear, I think. Yeah. And that's a great point. Even if Clarita has this vision, does everybody else have the vision? And that's why I have you on, Sam, and that's why I do this podcast, to make sure everyone is singing from the same page of the choir handbook. Okay, so let's let's talk about personnel. You brought that up, and that's kind of a nice segue. And there's a lot of potential changes this year. There's also a lot of maybe new politics weighing into this. So let's talk about the people and the politics of the Fed in 2021. And let's think about the timeline as it relates to, the, I think, the first big position. That's the Fed chair. So so talk us through what's at stake this year and when will this all unfold? Yeah. So Jay, Jay Powell, is, his term as chair is up in February 2022, but we probably will have a Fed chair decision this fall. So right now we're, we're sort of like the Fed chair sweepstakes are about to begin if they haven't already. Um, and I remember in December 2016, there were already contenders, you know, giving sort of campaigny speeches right after Trump had won about seeming to make their case for why they should be Fed chair. So I think the um, the term is up February 2022, uh, but we'll get a decision, I think, probably likely in the fall. I think the two top candidates, I think, are Leo Brainerd and Jay Powell. I think we usually have people from the Fed stepping into leadership role so we don't usually have outsider. We could talk. We could talk more about potential outsiders. But I see those two as as the top candidates, and I'm happy to talk through what I see as the case for both of them, which I think is a little a little bit different, even though they're in some ways very closely connected and working very closely together. Yes. Why don't we do that, Sam? Start with uh, Chair Powell. Why he should return as the chair? I think the key thing is with Chair Powell is well, there, there's five things I'd love to hit. One. Pre-pandemic, he was assaulting the natural rate and, you know, especially the, the natural rate of unemployment. And that was basically from the start of his chairmanship. He was very skeptical about using these fixed point estimates as sort of guides to policy. And, you know, from our perspective in Employ America, even in 2019, when we were way below the committee's estimates for maximum employment, he was saying memorably, we need to see heat to call something hot. In other words, we need to see wage growth to call maximum employment. And as late as December 2019, he was saying this is just a start in terms of labor market progress. So, you know, the, the fear we had always had is the Fed's going to cut off more employment gains um, before we actually get to a point when people have rising wages and 
you know, people on the margins are pulled back in. And he was, at least rhetorically, very much in a space where he was, you know, sort of on our, on our wavelength. And then you've talked a lot of, on your show about the response to the coronavirus recession. And we have our issues with what happened. But on the whole, it was aggressive, multidimensional, experimental response that I think took the crisis very seriously in all its in all its manifestations. And, you know, one thing that got a little bit lost because we talked so much about monetary policy, I don't know if there's a Fed chair who's ever been more vocal about fiscal policy and ever allowed himself to be used as a tool to get more fiscal policy. If you go back and look at Nancy Pelosi's press releases, <laughs> she is justifying CARES and justifying heroes on the back of her conversations with Jay Powell to such an extent that even though he has great relationships, it seems, with Republicans in the Senate, by the fall, people in the Senate were, Republicans were vocally pushing back on him because he was so outspoken about the need for fiscal that it seemed like he was taking sides in the House Democrats want more, Senate Republicans want less sort of fight about what what sort of relief bill. So here's someone who has gone to bat for not just an aggressive monetary policy response, but an aggressive fiscal policy response and, and basically staked, you could see it as staking the Fed's credibility on that. And so the third thing I'll say is in September, he led the committee to this very aggressive forward guidance. So the committee said, we're not going to raise rates until we reach maximum employment and, and not or, and have gotten to 2% inflation threshold, which for us, that and is so key, right? So he's saying that, that reaching maximum employment is a necessary condition for interest rate list up, which if you run it, if you run it back, if we'd had that in place, it's not clear we would have had any rate hikes from 2015 to 2018, right? This is like a super dovish potentially framework. So, you know, that's, I would say that's a point in his favor. And you can see that some of Biden's advisors like Jared Bernstein and others have talked really in a really complimentary way about his leadership in that regard. I'd say two, two other things for Powell. One is Janet Yellen was the first Democrat to run the Fed since Paul Volcker. And she faced sharp pressure on a number of fronts, a number of political fronts, from talking about inequality to, you know, the perception that she was too dovish. And I think the simple fact of the matter is you can get away with more dovishness as a Fed chair if you have an R next to your name and you were appointed by Donald Trump than if you're, you have the progressive label on you. I think that's a real, fair or not, I think that's a real factor. Um, you will remember, David, that when Yellen came in, all of a sudden there was like a, I mean, not all of a sudden, but there was a, a heightened clamoring of like, can the Berkeley labor economists, you know, do what it takes to like normalize interest rates, you know, this whole media cycle and definitely congressional cycle. And I think Jay Powell has the potential to avoid some of that, partly because he's been in the job, partly because he's a Republican. And then the final thing, which might loom the largest, and I don't know, I don't know Joe Biden, so I haven't talk to him about this, but he's very much in the mode of an institution healer, whereas Donald Trump was an institution disruptor, right? And if you think about his time in Washington, so he saw Paul Volcker get reappointed by Reagan. He saw Greenspan get reappointed by H.W. Bush, Clinton, W. Bush, and then, of course, Obama reappointed Bernanke. So these are all... Um, the Yellen not being retained was the first time in a very long time we had had a one-term Fed chair who wanted a second term. So part of me thinks, you know, Biden will want to restore that sort of institutional arrangement where we don't just dump the, the person because they're from the opposite party uh, if they're doing a, if they're doing a good job, sort of. A, so I think, I think all of those things are, are working for Powell. And of course, there are things that are working against him that I'm happy to talk about. But yeah, those are great points. And I just want to go back and touch on a few of them. Your point about Powell being skeptical of U star, R star. I mean, it's, it's so true. And I, and I go back to his speech, Navigating by the Stars at Jackson Hole, very clearly laid out, you know, that it's difficult to navigate by the stars. We don't know the R star or U star in real time. So I think it's a great point. He brings in some healthy skepticism where maybe someone who 
formerly trained as a PhD economist may, may have kind of, you know, followed the party line or rephrase it, had a harder time maybe, you know, thinking outside the box. Now, to be clear, and we had this discussion on Twitter recently, having a PhD shouldn't be a detriment against you. And, and sometimes you get people, we won't mention any names, but some regional Fed presidents who weren't PhDs who were a disaster, I think both of us would agree, in terms of their policy in 2008. So it's, it's really, it's, I think it's the personality more than anything, having a sense of humility, you know, knowing that we there's new things to learn and, and not being, you know, preset on a, a course that you can't vary from. Another point you brought up, I think is important, is it t- touches on his political savviness. There's a, an article that mentioned, or he said that he was going to wear out the carpet on Capitol Hill. You know, he made a point to visit, 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 visit. He's a smart operator, and, and that's worth a lot in D.C., more so than you know, knowing that the deep underlying equations of a DSGE model is knowing how to, to reach these people who are going to make your life easier or tougher, depending on where you stand. And, and then finally, your last point about continuity and restoring institutional you know, vigor and, and maybe healing, that, that's a great, I think, compelling point, too. So those are very strong points, all five of them. But I believe you can make a strong case for Leo Brainerd as well. So why don't you do that? Yeah. So in some, you know, we've said a lot of nice things about... J. Powell's sort of views about labor markets and dovish monetary policy. And, you know, he's really, com- I, everything that he's said and done, the, especially the last two years, suggests he's pretty committed to, to full employment. But in some ways, Lael was there first. I mean, she basically, as soon as she got on the board, she was very, she pushed back pretty hard against the move to tighten policy. And we just have the 2015 transcripts just got released last week. And she basically says, I don't think there's a great case for hiking at this meeting. And this is December 2015. We haven't, not only have we not hit our inflation target, and not only are we probably not going to because global situation is getting more complicated and the dollar is getting stronger and whatever. But she was also saying, I think we need to look beyond the unemployment rate and look at at, at participation and basically suggesting that there was more more slack in labor markets. So she she was the, and she didn't end up dissenting, but you know she was she was there. I think the one the one counterpoint that critics could come up with was where she and Jay might have diverged is you know by by September 2018 there was a ton of narrative about overheating and we had the Trump tax cuts on top of the budget deal on top of tariffs and it was just going to be this perfect storm for inflation and she said in September 2018 that we would need a year or two more of hikes so that's like four to eight more hikes after the rate hacking cycle stopped literally two months later but um, but that that's I feel like that's a little bit of a blip in her record and she has been she has been pretty pretty interested and engaged on these questions of reevaluating how we think about labor market slack and how we reevaluate, you know, this environment of, of low inflation, low interest rates. I think the, the key thing with Lael is regulations. So, you know, if there's a place where there's unified sort of democratic dissatisfaction with Jay Powell, it's on the supervision. And, you know, one way I like to think about it is Congress is much more interested in supervision than the president is, um, usually, I think. And you can see that in the Humphrey Hawkins hearings that, you know, this is supposed to be a monetary policy hearing and a lion's share of the questions are about, you know, these these, these issues of supervision. So I, I think there'll be a caucus of folks who, who would prefer, in, in the Congress, uh, who would prefer Lael to, to Jay Powell. She has dissented at least 20 times on regulatory matters in the last two plus years, which I tried to go back and count all the regulatory dissents in Fed history, but I only got a few decades deep. But suffice it to say, she alone has more regulatory dissents than all other governors combined going back, you know, two or three decades at least, just in the last two plus years. And it's on a variety of, of stuff. So she's she dis- she wanted a counter cyclical capital buffer to be activated. Um, she dissented on that. She wanted the Fed to stop suspend uh, bank dividends during this crisis. She you know there's there's a whole bunch of stuff around 
capital requirements, li liquidity regulations, um, where she's dissented. But she's both done that and staked her claim that says, you know, we've gone too far on the deregulatory side. But also, it's, it hasn't all been sour grapes. She's also simultaneously managed to win some fights in the Fed. So most notably, you know, on CRA, Community Reinvestment Act, the OCC was trying to do a full revamp and basically Leo Brainerd got, got the board to push back and take her side. And, and it, it became very contentious. You can, your listeners can look up, look up argument, you know, arguments about that. And then there was a payment systems issue, which I'm a little bit less familiar with, but I think she was internally leading the charge and private sector wanted to do this on their own. And um, she succeeded in persuading her colleagues to bring it in house. Anyway, I think this is a, if you, if you remember back to the conversation about Powell, one way people described it was, we're getting yelling on monetary policy, but with a more Republican-friendly regulatory posture, right? You can sort of see the, the inverse for Lael, right? So it's like, we're getting Jay Powell on monetary policy, but we're getting a much, we're getting a, a, a supervision posture that's much more, much more aligned with sort of where the Biden administration is. And what, one note that's kind of funny on that, Nick Timrose had a good had a good piece in which he broke the news to me at least that Jay Powell has invited Lael into the Troika. You know, usually because the committee is so big, usually the Fed chair, the vice chair, and the New York Fed president are, are really sort of teeing up all the conversations and decisions for the committee. And the three of them sort of operate as, you know, the command center for the FOMC. And that, that's been the case going back multiple committees. And Nick reported that Jay Lael has entered that. So now it's a quartet of officials who are doing that. And that she was, you know, in on his call on Jay Powell's calls with, with Treasury. So it's, it's kind of funny that the two leading contenders are actually seem to be working quite closely together right now. You know, this is all speculation, I should say. And it could, it could be the case that, that Leo Brainerd is actually going to move over and become Treasury Secretary after Janet Yellen steps down. And, you know, so maybe this is, this is a moot point. But um, that would be the, the main thing I see as the reasons why the Biden people might, might select Leo. That's very interesting. And if I can digress just for a minute back to Brainerd's record, her resistance to raising rates in 2015, I think is a very interesting one. And she had the right perspective. She ultimately voted. The voting itself was an interesting story, too. She did it, she said, if I understand correctly, to maintain the credibility of monetary policy. She wanted to support it, even though she was uncomfortable with it. And, and that's something that just the politics, the internal, you know, getting votes on one issue, supporting someone on another issue, that by itself is a fascinating conversation. But Brainerd's view, I, I think she had it right, of one of the few people at the board who had it right, or at the, at the Fed who had it right, and that is the, the Fed talking up rates in 2014, you know, led to a higher expected path of, of rates in the future, which helped contribute to the dollar's rise, which in turn helped slow the global economy down. And she saw that. I mean, she saw that their rate hike talk was coming back to bite the U.S. economy in the rear. And I, I appreciate that about her. And I think probably that has something to do with the fact that she was, you know, she oversaw international affairs at Treasury and she's really into the international economy and has, I think, a rich perspective to bring. And I think that's valuable in a world we live in where we are a very globalized system and the dollar is so important. It's good to have someone who can kind of keep the focus on that. But two very interesting contenders. Now, do you have anyone outside that? group there? I mean, any outsiders who have been discussed who could possibly make the cut? Yeah, this is me speculating. The Treasury Secretary and the Chair of the Council of Economic Advisors are always thrown into these conversations. So Cecilia Rouse wouldn't seem to be, based on her academic focus, uh, someone who would be sort of in line for this, but she's in a prominent position. She's super accomplished and um, so you can never you can never count out sort of the people working most directly with with the president, and then you know obviously Janet Yellen is Treasury Secretary, and there would be some sort of um, I don't know if it's uh, you, you know full circle ness. She got passed over by Trump and got to finish her second term with Biden. I'm kind of skeptical of both of those. There's one other person, um, Rafael Bostic, was in the Obama administration, and now he's Atlanta Fed president. And so he's already in the Federal Reserve System, and um, he, his name came up a bunch for Treasury Secretary, and has come up a little bit 
people speculating about Fed chair. I think the challenge there is, in my mind, he's clearly not as progressive on the labor market pieces and not as dovish as either Brainerd or Powell. And, you know, as you said earlier in the program, he's talked up tapering recently, talked up a rate hike, trying to, he's basically trying to move up the, the t- timeline for rate hikes potentially to 2022. And even before that, he, even while Jay Powell was sort of saying, we can't take Nehru too seriously, Rafael Bostic in his first big speech was, you know, saying we, we can't actually let unemployment go below CBO's definition of Nehru or like really bad things will happen. And so there's an interest. So I would be surprised if, um, if he became the, uh, became the pick, but there's at least been some, some buzz about him. And then, you know, there's always private sector people who enter the conversation. I find it hard to imagine going straight from outside government to become Fed chair. That hasn't been the pattern of the last uh, many years. Okay. Well, let's talk about some of the other openings at the Fed. So another position that may come open is the vice chair for supervision. Doesn't Randy Quarles roll in this year? Yep. So Randy Quarles' term ends in October as vice chair for supervision. He might end up staying on the board a little bit. His his term at the Financial Stability Board, where he is also he chairs the Financial Stability Board, which is an international, you know, group of central banks, and um, that doesn't end until the end of this year. But his term as vice chair ends in October, and um, that that's a highly consequential pick because it's as I told you. I mean, from Congress perspective, you know, he he has been enemy number one for congressional Democrats, right? chipping away at Dodd-Frank in, in their view. And so this will be this will be a place where there'll be a very stark, there might be continuity in other places on Fed, you know, on, on chair and vice chair. This is some, this is a place where I would imagine a, a pivot. And yeah, there's there's many candidates you could think about. Nellie Lang was um, uh, rumored to, to be going into treasury. She's formerly at the Fed and um, she was actually nominated by President Trump, but Republicans in the Senate pushed back really hard on her because she had a reputation as a, a, a regulator who had sort of implemented Dodd Frank, so you, you can and she's a former colleague of, of Janet Yellen, so you can imagine her as a potential. I think, and I, I you know I have no intelligence on this, but you can imagine someone like Bharat Ramamuti who worked for Elizabeth Warren and then he was on the Oversight Commission for uh, that, that Pat Toomey was also on, and you know he he would be sort of the Dan Tarullo model where he you know he's a lawyer. And he's worked in policy and politics and, you know, on, on these issues and would, would be coming in. And, but I, you know, I have, I have no, I have no intel on, on any of those positions. I'm just speculating about sort of the profiles of people you can imagine in that, in that role. So they've got to be people who have a fairly high profile in addition to having the policy chops to fill the position. So you can't just pick someone who might be really good with financial regulation. You've got to have someone who's been active, who's known. Yeah. I think there will be a desire to make change right away. So I'm imagining the the Biden team doesn't want to go through the learning pains, you know, somebody having to get up to speed, you know, on either the, the, the current Fed architecture or the Fed itself, which I would think lends itself to someone who's really been engaged in a direct way in these in these debates. That would be my guess. Well, let me throw out three names, which I haven't heard, but just to make it interesting and maybe stir the pot a little bit for the Biden transition team. You know, if we're going to fill that position, if this is going to come open, I mean, why not Morgan Ricks, Lev Menin, Kate Judge? I mean, these are people who I think are following this conversation closely. There's others, and I apologize, I didn't list everyone who's been a part of this program or I'm engaged with on Twitter. But those are three people just at the top of my head who seem would fill that Dan Trullo kind of role. Yeah, I think them and, you know, there's a whole host of other people we're probably forgetting that. uh, And I think I think Lev was on the um, the transition team for for Biden this time. So. But yeah, there's there's no shortage of people who, who have expertise in that area. So, Okay. And finally, the open seat at the Fed. So the one that you helped keep open, Judy Shelton's seat. Any talk about that? I haven't heard any talk yet. Uh, I think that they could do it at any time once, he's, once Biden is inaugurated. Obviously, they have a whole bunch of positions to fill in the government, nominations to make at Treasury and, and all the other executive agencies. And 
what I would like to avoid is a situation like we had during the Obama administration where there was an initial Dan Tarullo appointment and then there were three seats that were left open until April 2010. So hopefully we avoid that kind of delay. It would be nice to have a fully staffed head board. But, you know, from my perspective, I'm hoping that what they'll consider is folks who are both progressive or, you know, aligned with us uh, on sort of how we think about um, priorities, but also people who can win arguments internally. You know, I think that's a sort of an underappreciated point, which is like, it's one thing to, you know, to agree with me. It's another thing to be able to agree with me and to like win the day at the Fed, you know. I think I think people like um, Julia Coronado, who's a friend of the program, you know, who's a former Fed staffer, is someone who would come in and, you know, right away be be respected and listened to and know the building. And, you know, she's been very out front on a number of different topics that are important to us. But so I'm, I'm hoping I'm hoping sort of that that balance of, yes, you know, focused on on full employment, focused on, you know, but also like can actually move things inside the building. Yeah, very interesting and something to follow closely as this year unfolds. Go ahead. One thing I should say is um, our, our mutual friend Caleb Nygaard just wrote an op-ed about labor. And he, he went back in the archives and actually, even though the Federal Reserve Act says, you know, that Fed officials should come from all various walks of life, we never actually had a, a sitting member of the FOMC who comes from labor, like any sort of labor aligned institution. And, you know, Bill Spriggs, who's the chief economist at AFL-CIO, a very accomplished labor economist, you know, he would he would seem to slot in there and it would seem to he would seem to, uh, you know, be consistent with the Biden theme of sort of elevating labor and balancing things out in terms of, you know, capital and labor. Uh, so, you know, that, that would that would be one way they could go as well. Well, we'll look forward to seeing this unfold. And again, you will be on top of it. So we will follow you on Twitter, Sam, maybe get you back on the show later in the year. when We have an update on some of these positions. Okay, so that's the Fed itself. Of course, the Fed doesn't operate in a vacuum. There's political pressure. There's you know, D.C. around it surrounding the government. So there's a lot of politics at play as well. So let's talk about that now. We have a new chair of the Senate Banking Committee, Sherrod Brown. And uh, what does that mean for the Fed going forward? Yeah, actually, as I said before, I think Congress, when it comes to the Fed, is much more concerned about the supervision aspects of the Fed, whereas the president is concerned about the monetary policy. And, you know, if you talk to folks on the Hill, I think the thing that they're most frustrated with are on the supervision side. So I can imagine a lot of focus there. It is interesting that Senator Brown last year released a, um, a bill basically authorizing or demanding that um, the Fed create sort of uh, bank accounts. So Fed accounts, um, I think he, I think he called it digital wallets in the in his actual legislation. But I think he is interested in this sort of this issue, uh, especially after after the CARES Act and after the thirteen three facilities. I think we will see a much more emphasis on how can the Fed work more directly with you know households or small businesses you know in a crisis. And I think there might be appetite to sort of look at how can we do better next time on the on the 133 facilities and and that might require new authorities I, you know in a 5050 senate where i'm just i'm a little skeptical that like big fed legislation would have the votes to pass you know reforming the federal reserve act or anything like that um, so i would expect that um, a lot of focus in the hearings on on the supervision piece and then um, maybe also a focus on on this sort of like how can we give the Fed more tools to, to be you know, not, not necessarily having to work through the financial system? So the emphasis in Congress will be on regulation, maybe giving a, a few more tools in the margin. But what you didn't say is, will the Fed be on top of the Fed about its new framework? And, and that's what I'm wondering. You know, will, they, will Senator Brown be saying, hey, are you guys living up to your new framework or not? Yeah, it's an interesting question. I mean, I'm not necessarily expecting a ton of backsliding from the Fed, you know, in 2021 in terms of, you know, their four guidance. But yeah, hopefully, hopefully if there was, we would, we would see, uh, you know, and we saw, you know, I, I was pleasantly surprised in the last two years, we saw much more engagement, especially on the House side, you know, everyone from um, Trey Hollingsworth, you know, to AOC, you know, engaging on, on these questions. So, 
I, I just don't know. You know. I think that'll come up in the hearing. I just don't know that there'll be a legislative push or anything of that sort related to Fed framework. What about the president? So Joe Biden is now the president. Last evening, he introduced a big stimulus bill. Some people are calling it the fiscal palooza. Um, let me just run through some of the numbers. $400 billion toward the COVID response. $1 trillion divided between $2,000 checks and $400 in unemployment insurance. $440 billion in small business and communities, another $130 billion for schools. And there are a number of other items in there, but it's it's a pretty large number, $1.9 trillion total, a good chunk of the economy. I mean, you know, depending on where you measure where nominal GDP should be, it could be 8 to 9% of, of you know, the dollar size of the economy. So that's a fairly large bill. So what do you think this means for the Fed in 2021? Well, I think they have to be happy about it. I mean, they were sort of asking for, I mean, not sort of, it seems like they're asking for this sort of size, you know, fiscal fiscal package. And and not, not just the size. I mean, they have been pretty clear, like there's there, there's a there's a, a macro aspect to this and getting the macro dials right. And then there's a relief aspect to this where it's like there's a segment of people who desperately need help and need it in big quantity and and there's a huge investment we, do, we need to make about defeating the, the virus. So I, I have to think they're sort of pleased with it. And I don't know that it changes their, it seems like at least Powell and Clarida and Brainerd are in a position where they're as close to, you know, whites of inflation's eyes as you can get. And they're saying, this is great, but we're not, we're not going to change things in expectation that fiscal will have a big pop, right? We want to see it, like show us the inflation outcomes, show us the labor market outcomes, and then we can talk about adjusting. So from their point of view, I guess maybe the way to put it would be it's, it's hopeful that they, they're in play for better outcomes. We're, we're in play for better outcomes, but I don't see them changing anything until we actually see those outcomes. Okay. So you, I think, are a little more optimistic that they will stick through with their commitment in this new framework. I'm a little more worried. I'm a little more worried that when inflation does pass 2%, there's going to be this this large outcry from public commentary, from the media, from Wall Street, even from Congress. What are you doing? What are you doing? And and I I think I have some reason to to be worried that this is going to happen. I, I already see some articles talking about this when when the ten year Treasury yield went to one point ten percent. People were talking, what does it mean? But but moreover, if you look at forecasts, so you look at consensus forecasts, if you look at break evens, if you look at the Fed's own SEP forecast of where inflation will be in three years out. It's 2% at most. You don't see evidence of a makeup. You don't see, I want to see a little bit more progress. and I'm not seeing it. And I'm just wondering if, if the public has not internalized what this new framework means. And therefore, when the Fed does come, let's say, second half of 2021 and the economy is running really hot, say inflation hits 3%, what are they going to do? Are they going to say, hey, just see through it, all is well? I mean, I think it's kind of, flesh this out. I think this is one of the challenges of an inflation framework. And I know that's why you got you and both your team and myself, we, we advocate an, a nominal income approach. This should be sold as we're restoring your incomes to where they would have been in the absence of the pandemic. But the way they're going to have to sell it because it's an inflation targeting framework is we need inflation to be higher temporarily. And, and that to me is the political economy challenge of this framework. But you, I think, are a little more optimistic that they can still pull it off. Is that fair? Well, I don't know. It's uh, it's it's a great question, and it's a committee. So um, I I did a Twitter poll a few months ago, and I, this was maybe this was before coronavirus. And I said, I asked, you know, would Jay Powell be singing this full employment song if inflation was two point three instead of one point seven? And a lot of people were skeptical that he would be. I guess I'm a little bit more hopeful, given you know, that, that and that key and in their, in their forward guidance for us, you know, made a lot of difference, but I agree. I I think, I think we should be skeptical until they prove it. And yeah, it will be a different environment if inflation is, you know, if we have 2.8, 3.1, whatever, and, and, and the conversation changes both on the FOMC and in press and, you know, congressional hearings. And so, yeah, we should wait till we see the the whites of the framework's eyes, you know, uh, before we end in our skepticism. 
And that's where your organization and, and my program need to step up and say, look, Fed, this is how you explain it. You explain it in terms of dollar incomes, not inflation. You need to really market and pitch the, the right angle. In fact, Sam, I recall a, a visit we had with Chair Powell, the two of us, and Carl Smith, and we tried to make this point. You know, this is the way you're going to make this policy work, is you need to talk about higher incomes. We were actually trying to pitch nominal GDP targeting or labor income, but but I think in general, this is the way you understand makeup policy. Okay, the time we have left, let's transition into the Treasury Secretary. Jenna Yellen, you already mentioned her, but, but she could have a, a large role both in terms of what the Fed does, because she might shape some of the people who get appointed, but she might also work in a way that Treasury Secretaries haven't worked before in, in coordinating policy between Treasury and the Fed. And maybe she'll advocate, some have suggested she might advocate for, you know, policies that would require support from Congress, take an active role such as, you know, central bank digital currency, something along those lines. So do you see her as being, you know, pivotal or important in what the Fed does this year? I don't know. Uh, I don't know. I mean, she definitely, I think, will have a big voice on the nominations front. Your listeners will remember that Steve Mnuchin is sort of the reason why Jay Powell became Fed chair. You know, he he was he maneuvered that so that that Jay Powell became Fed chair. So Treasury Secretary will have will have a big influence there. I don't know how much action there will be on thirteen three programs, and you know, in the absence of that, I don't know what what she will push in terms of um, Fed policy. And I think you know, ultimately, she and Powell are both institutionalists, and you know, I think she will be careful about overstepping her bounds and being seen as sort of entering the Fed's turf. And frankly, there's a lot to do on the like other aspects of the job. So I think I don't know if I had to guess, I would think it was a little bit of a red herring, just because she, you know, she is Fed chair. So what's she going to do on the Fed? But I would imagine that actually most of her focus will be elsewhere. And I'm not sure it will have huge implications for, um, you know, her specifically being in that role will have huge implications for the Fed itself. But I'm, I'm mostly guessing, so I um, very well could be proven wrong. I think you're right in, in terms of she'll have a full plate and most of the plate will not include the Fed. I mean, she has the vaccine, get the virus beat. I mean, that's, that is the biggest key to getting our economy going again is bringing an end to this virus, getting those vaccines out there. And, and you know, the Treasury is going to help fund a large part of that, as well as the relief, the other parts of the relief bill that Biden has proposed. So yeah, I th- think you're right. There'll be other issues where she'll play an important role in terms of the economy. And maybe the way to look at it is, you know, to the extent those policies do foster a robust recovery, her influence will be felt in how the Fed has to respond to that robust recovery we have at the end of the year. So it's going to be nonetheless very interesting. And, and you know, and, and maybe another way to look at it also is you won't have this disagreement between, you know, Secretary Mnuchin and Jay Powell we had at the end of last year with, with Janet Yellen. They're going to be much more together, you know, when it comes to making these important decisions. So I think, you know, all in all, it's going to be an exciting year to watch and um, a lot of interesting positions will be, to be filled at the chair. So you mentioned a chair conversation will get started fairly soon. Yeah, I think we'll start seeing stories, you know, in the spring about who's who's in the running, who's who's being considered. And um, and I'm sure predict it will put up a betting market where all the the gamblers can can bet on who will become Fed chair. So, yeah, I, I would imagine um, I would imagine sometime in the spring we'll start hearing more about it. OK, so last question before we have to end the show. What is your estimated probability of Judy Shelton getting confirmed? Oh, we're, we're at, there would have to be like, um, what's, what's the probability of a meteor, a good sized meteor hitting the earth in the next, in the next six days? <laughs> no, I, I think she doesn't have the votes anymore. Um, and the Senate is not in session. So her nomination at long last is, is looking to like, it's going to expire. And, um, it has been, you know, she, she was first rumored right after Stephen Moore dropped out. So that was May, 2019. And, Trump tweeted her out on July 2019. So it's been a it's been a long, a long road, but it looks like she will not be joining the Fed. Yeah. Would you say her nomination process has been the longest of any in recent history? I don't know. The Peter Diamond 
nomination at the beginning of the Obama term actually was out there for a long time and then he had to be renominated in 2011. So if you put them together, it might be, his might be longer. It's a very similar story though. They, they both were out there for a long time and finally this, they kind of, he withdrew his name at some point. I think she's just going to have time run out on her. Yep. Yep. He withdrew his name because he wasn't getting a uh, committee vote. Yep. Okay. Well, with that, our time is up. Our guest today has been Sam Bell. Sam, thank you so much for coming on the show again. Thank you so much, David. Macro Musings is produced by the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. If you haven't already, please subscribe via iTunes or your favorite podcast app. And while you're there, please consider rating us and leaving a review. This helps other thoughtful people like you find the podcast. Thanks for listening.